since I started in the early 90s till now, visual effects has, has gone from a very small specialized industry that was mostly a post-production field um, to now really a key part of any film, and for some films it is the film. So visual effects now can start even the development stage where a script assumes a certain amount of visual effects component to even tell the story. The, the main actor can be a visual effect or assisted by a visual effect. So it's gone from being a post-production area to really the entire filmmaking process could begin and end with visual effects. The qualities of visual effects supervisor needs are endurance. You're the first on, first off of a show. Communication. Most of your job is to be able to communicate to your client and then from your client down to your team. You're really just a conduit of information and help forming ideas so that people can understand their job. Another skill is a sense of humor, the ability to let things roll off of you. The whole film is going to go up and down all the time. There'll be highs and lows, and you really have to just keep a steady, keep steady the whole time. Never let them see you sweat. Give everybody confidence that the people working for you know that you've got everything handled, and the people you're working for feel the same way, even if it's not always true. For technical skills, you've got a team beneath you that hopefully have more specialized skill than you do in a particular area, but you have to know enough to, to coach them to make sure that they don't get stuck. You don't have to know as much as them, but you have to be conversant in their areas. Creatively, you have to be able to not get stuck in one idea. Sometimes your client has a clear idea of what they want and your job is just to execute, and sometimes they really need you to come up with something. They'll tell you what they need the story to do, but they can't tell you how to get there. So anywhere along that spectrum, you're expected to have some kind of creative thinking skills. I spent a number of years working on Gollum for Lord of the Rings, which was really the first significant um, digital character that was performed by an actor. So Andy Serkis was Gollum. He started off cast as the voice and quickly became the entire character. But that character wouldn't have been, made it on screen, wouldn't have been the Tolkien version of Gollum without computer graphics creating the visual side of the character. So I think that kicked off what's been a number of major films that have used that technique. But then there's been smaller examples um, like Tron where they had the same, same actor in the film as a younger version of himself and an older version of himself. And without visual effects, that idea would just wouldn't have worked. They, they probably wouldn't even have bothered to write the story that way if they didn't know that they could count on a com computer-assisted technique. There are now screenplays being written that can only be done because visual effects are around. A Harry Potter is a good example of the collaboration between special effects and visual effects. The simple version is special effects happens in front of the camera, things that the actors interact with, explosions on set, and they can come up with something obviously completely real, much quicker, less expensive, um, and more tangible than anything we can do. And visual effects happens after the shoot. And then there's a lot of opportunities where special effects knows that visual effects is going to come in and do something on top of or integrated with what they're doing. One of the most exciting things that I think special effects does is pyrotechnics, blowing things up. Um, it's fun to watch in person, and it's fun to see on film as well. It's something that computer graphics can do, but it's complicated, it's tricky, um, and a lot less fun than blowing something up on set. So one example of visual effects, a classic use of special effects and visual effects is they'll do the explosion on set so that you can have the, the interaction of the pyro element with the set around it and then the actor will be shot separately and put over the top of it. The most recent Bond film had some great moments of an actor looking like he was inches away from death as a giant fireball engulfed him. And obviously they can't do that on set, nobody wants to try, but we can now make special effects look even that much more dangerous because we can put things together that wouldn't have been able to happen together on set. One of the most fun things about working on a Harry Potter film is the variety. It's rare you get a project where you do digital characters, digital environments, effects work, you know, classic effects work like spells and magic and fireworks. 
and even invisible effects of set extensions, things that the, the audience isn't meant to notice. So you get the, the big effects and the small effects all mixed in together for thousands of shots. The big motivation to go digital with Hogwarts, um, I guess it was twofold. The way that films are made now, a lot of decisions are really hard to make up front. Um, the story is developing, the film is developing all the way till the deadline. And you don't want to be constrained with this one big shot you have in mind that once you see it coming together, you wish it was just a little bit higher angle or a little bit closer. If it's a miniature you're talking about, it has to be shot. And that shooting process takes a certain amount of planning. Once you shot it, you have to then process it and put it together. If you've got a fully digital asset, you can run things right up to the, right up to the wire. The freedom you get digitally is that the camera movement can be done really up to the last minute. So whether it's a good or bad thing that things can go that close to the deadline, for a director creatively, it's a great thing. The other side of going digital with a miniature, a big one like Hogwarts and a classic one, is that that miniature, parts of it were built in the very beginning on the first Harry Potter film, and it's just wear and tear. Setting up the entire miniature of the school one more time for the eighth film, it would have required so much repair work, so much care, um, and probably so much fragility once it was all set up that the decision was made, let's just build it digitally. And in this case, the production design and art departments were fully involved. So the same care went into the look of Hogwarts digitally as it would have been if it had been built as a miniature. The most challenging part of The Last Harry Potter, I think, for my work was, um, well, creatively, it was the death of Voldemort. How do you kill one of the most iconic characters of a decade? How do you do it with care, with taste, be true to the source material, but also make it fit within the number of shots allocated? And we went through a number of different design processes from a really big, slow effect that probably fit in terms of the gravity of the situation, um, and some more quick, simple things that felt too quick and simple. And in the end, I think we came up pretty late in the game with a really nice way of making something physical, tangible, but also a little bit ethereal. Voldemort eventually dies by a process of desiccation and flaking, and then those flakes float away into the air in a slightly peaceful way instead of any screaming or guts and gore or anything else, which wouldn't have felt right. I think there's a lot of great moments in the last film, but for the work I was involved in, something that I, I keep coming back to is a lot of the work we did in the Room of Requirement, before anything explosive happens, before the fire effects, when the kids are just wandering around and we're extending the set off into infinity, we started with a beautiful, enormous set that was built full of furniture and knickknacks and, and little interesting objects. It just felt, felt like a classic Harry Potter ambiance environment and it got a lot of screen time for your eyes to look around and hopefully no one ever notices our work in there. It's sort of surprising to myself when I think that that might be one of the, my favorite moments because there's so much stuff we did like wand duels and battles that are more memorable maybe if you think back and just think for a moment. But thinking back on making the film, I really enjoyed those just big views in that interesting room. More and more production designers are becoming aware of what visual effects can do for them, with them, um, so that their work on location, on set, is really just the starting point of visual effects. And on Potter films in particular, we got so much great direction. In particular for me, the fifth film, Order of the Phoenix, where we did the Ministry of Magic atrium, was my first um, first real brush with Stuart Craig's department, the art department really needs to take the lead. And on Potter Films, they, they really did. Whether what they were designing would ever be built 
on a stage or whether it was only going to be ending up in a computer, they put the same care into everything. They give you blueprints, um, concept illustrations, reference photos. They want you to be as immersed in the world that they're creating as they have been for years. So that even if you're just coming in to do one little bit of a film, like the Ministry of Magic Atrium, you're walking into something that's been fully thought out, fully fleshed out, and you've been given a map and lots of resources whenever you need anything. You know, anything from what, what type of wood grain is in the floor to what would I see if I looked up where I'm standing, they know the answer because they've thought it all through. The Potter franchise has been huge for the British industry of visual effects. As the facilities grew from small and unable to take on a whole lot of com complex or volume work, by the last film, a number of facilities in London really could take on any film out there. Harry Potter was the, the testing ground for a lot of the artists, for a lot of the companies. Could they handle tentpole projects? Because Potter films have always been that. They've always been A-level, tentpole, big films. And because we were able to prove ourselves working on those, other studios, other franchises out there were willing to also try us. And eventually, everyone was proven able to compete with the rest of the world.